All right, Jason emailed me. So he's got some questions here about uh, this geometry pace 1114. First question is problem five on page 10. So uh, let's look at it and see if I can uh, help you see a few points that you might use. Uh, number one, I want you to go to page six. <clears throat> what I've noticed going through the geometry paces is that whenever they have a theorem, the problems coming up are for the purpose of trying to use that theorem. So this theorem says that the measure of an inscribed angle is equal to one half the measure of the intercepted arc. So in other words, if I draw a circle like this, and I draw an angle in here, this, <clears throat> this number of degrees is going to be half of this arc, okay? So if this is, let's say, 80 degrees, then right away I know that's 40 degrees. Um, let me erase that, and let's make it a bigger angle. So it doesn't matter where the angle is, if this angle is inscribed, then this angle, let's say that's 80 degrees, then that tells me that this arc has to be 160 degrees. So the inscribed angle is exactly one half of the arc. <clears throat> All right, so now let's look at the problem here on page 10, number five. And uh, I drew this here. This tells us that this line is parallel. So this is line DE is parallel to AC. Now, right now, it doesn't look like a line. I'm just going to extend it so that we can see that we have a line. Okay? Sometimes that helps. And then I want you to see that this is representing a line as well. So I have two parallel lines. You see that? And when the parallel lines are intercepted by a transversal, then we have angles that are congruent. So first of all, let's label, we have this angle here, and that is going to have to be congruent to that angle out there, all right? So that is one point that uh, you can make, and I think, is there a theorem about if a transversal intercepts two parallel lines, the alternate interior angles are congruent, all right? Um, what else do they, what do they give us here? Do they give us something about, um, well, they want us to prove that angle CBE. Okay, that's where we're headed. We're trying to prove that the measure of this angle here, so here's where I'm proving. The measure of angle CBE is equal to one half the measure of arc A B. Did I write that down right? Sorry. All right. Yeah. Now this is this is kind of tricky, and we did this way back in one of the first paces as well. We can say that angle C is congruent to angle what do we call this? C B E. Okay, they're congruent, but that's not the same as saying that the measures are equal. This represents the geometric figure itself, the actual drawing, saying that this is exactly the same size as this, but then we have to actually write it as the measure of angle C is equal to the, whoops, I didn't get M in there, measure of angle C, B, E. And if they're congruent, then it makes sense that the measures are equal, but we have to state that as two separate statements. And I think that's just, um, is that just the definition? Okay, yeah, definition of congruent angles. All right. Um, now, can we say that the measure of angle C here is equal to one half the measure of arc A, whoops, AB? Okay, so here's the arc. Can you see this? This arc here is going to be exactly double this angle. 
Okay, so the angle is half of the arc. And again, the reason we can say that is, da, 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 we just learned theorem 57, so we get to use it. Yay! And then, once we have this, we're really close to what we're trying to prove, and that is that the measure of CBE is also equal to this. Okay? So we have here, we made this statement that these two angles are congruent, therefore they're equal, and then I can substitute um, this angle, CBE, in place of measure of angle C. Okay? This angle out here is not um, inscribed, and so it's not opening up to the arc, but it is congruent to the angle that is. So now I can do substitution. You could set it up and do a um, transitive property if you set it up like a Z. That's, either way, I just, substitution to me is always easier, okay? And in a way, it doesn't matter what order you do these steps in, um, because you're going to come to the same conclusion. Just at the last step, you're going to have to do the substitution, and then once you do that, then you can make your final statement that you've proved. Okay? Sometimes it helps to extend the lines and try to, you know, on your page, write down what you're doing. This one doesn't have a lot of steps. Always look for how can I use the theorem that they just taught me. All right, so anyways, I hope that helped Jason. And I hope it helps some of the rest of you coming along behind him who might be doing this pace.